In this video, I'll introduce universal introduction, a derivation rule for predicate logic proofs. Universal introduction basically is a rule that says that we can reason to universally quantified formulas. These types of formulas can be derived from formulas that contains names, provided we meet certain restrictions. These restrictions are that the formula that contains the name that we're using universal introduction on, so that name does not occur as a premise or as an assumption in an open subproof, and the name does not occur in the resulting universally quantified formula. Essentially, universal introduction states that we can reason from a formula like PA to a universally quantified formula like universally quantified PX where here we're replacing this A with an X and putting a quantifier in front of it, provided we meet these two restrictions. So let's look at this rule in a little bit more detail. So the first thing to note about universal introduction is that it's an introduction rule. What this means is we're reasoning from a formula to a universally quantified formula. So we're reasoning from a formula with a name to a universally quantified well-formed formula. At first glance, this seems really strange and it doesn't seem like a legitimate rule. How can you reason from a formula that says that a particular item has the property G to everything having that property? It seems akin to reasoning, my cat is fat, therefore every or all cats are fat. This looks like a case of hasty generalization, where we reason from the fact that one or a limited number of individuals have a particular property to all the things having a particular property. The reason why universal introduction is acceptable has to do with the fact that the name we generalize or that we turn into a universally quantified variable could be any name. That is, if, when we're reasoning from PA to for all X PX, this name has to have special properties. It has to meet certain conditions. And the general condition is that this name could have been B or C or D or E or any name. And since that it could be any name, that is, since this name could refer to any item in our domain, this allows us to generalize. So one of the reasons that universal introduction is acceptable has to do with certain restrictions we place on when you can use universal introduction. And the core of that restriction has to do with the fact that the name that we universalize is arbitrary. Let's look at an example of this in the context of a proof. Suppose we're talking about a domain and I say everything is a leaf. And then I also say all leaves <laughs> or all the leaves are golden. Therefore, everything is golden. This looks like a valid argument. And we might represent this as follows. For everything is a leaf, we could write for all x lx, for all of the leaves are golden, we can write ax lx then gx. And for everything is golden, we would write the universal quantifier ax gx. In the context of a proof, we would reason as follows. First, we have the premises, ax, everything is a leaf, ax, lx, then gx, all of the leaves are golden. And then we could reason from ax, lx to la using universal elimination. We're reasoning from everything is a leaf to a named leaf that we name with A is a leaf. And also from AX LX, then GX, the second premise, we could reason using universal elimination. If, if a particular item is a leaf, then, then that particular item is golden. Next, from the fact that we have a particular item that we named A is a leaf, and we said that if a, that thing is a leaf, then it's golden, we could reason to using conditional elimination, also known as modus ponens, to that item is golden. Now the last step here is the use of universal introduction. That is, we want to know whether or not it's acceptable to reason from a particular item being golden to everything is golden. Like in our example up here, we reason to everything is golden. One of the reasons that we might say that this is acceptable, that in this instance, 
it's acceptable to use universal introduction, replacing the name A with a universally quantified variable X is because that this A here could have been B, it could have been C, it could have been D, it could be any name that refers to any item in the domain. And the reason for that is because this universally quantified LX and this universally quantified LX then GX, we could have used universal introduction to drive B or C or D here, or we could have used it to drive A or B or C or D here. So given the fact that this GA right here, this A could have been any name and those names could refer to any item in the domain, it looks acceptable to use universal introduction. So we need restrictions. These restrictions are necessary to prevent hasty generalizations. That is, we put restrictions on when you can use universal introduction to ensure that on a proof where we have a well-formed formula phi and we want to use universal introduction upon it, it's the case that for any name A occurring in that formula phi, it's such that that name A, so where is this name? This name A could have been any name, A or B or C or D. Another way of putting this is that while A, the name A, might pick out a specific individual in the domain, certain features of the proof make it such that the A could have picked out any individual in the domain. That is, there's nothing intrinsic to the proof that makes A such that it picks out a specific individual. A could have instead picked out any of the items in the domain. So let's take a look at some of the restrictions associated with universal introduction, and then we'll walk through a number of examples showing you how to use this rule and how not to use this rule. So whenever you're thinking about using universal introduction, so you're reasoning from something like PA to for all X, PX, you wanna make sure that you don't violate either of the two restrictions. The first is that this A here that we're reasoning from, it cannot occur as a premise in a formula that's found in a premise, and it can't occur in an assumption that's found in a, an active or open subproof. So for example, if we reason to PA by making an assumption, we couldn't immediately write AX PX. This would be like saying, uh, assume Alfred has a particular property P, therefore everyone has that particular property. So the A that we're reasoning from cannot occur in a premise or an assumption in an open subproof. And also the name A does not occur in the resulting universally quantified formula. This would be something like, let's say we said Alfred loves himself. We could reason of course to for all X, LXX, Assuming A is not found in as a premise or as an assumption in an open subproof, we could reason from A loves A or A loves him or herself to everyone loves themselves. But we couldn't reason from a particular individual loving themselves to for all X, L, X, A. That is everyone loves one single individual. So we need to make sure that the name A does not occur in the resulting universally quantified formula. So provided we adhere to these two restrictions, we can make use of, so now let's look at some examples. This is an example where we make use of universal introduction and everything is fine and dandy. At line one, we have a premise, which is AX PXX. At line two, we reason to PAA using universal elimination on line one. Then at line three, we take line two, which is PAA, and make use of universal introduction on it. Here, since A could have been B or C or D or E or any name, and those names could refer to every object in the domain, it's acceptable to make use of universal introduction. In other words, A does not occur in any premise or assumption in an active subproof, and A is not found in the resulting formula at line three. We don't see any instance of the name A. This is another acceptable use of universal introduction, but it's fairly more involved. In this example, what occurs is first there's an assumption of RAA, then at line two there's an instance of reiteration. At line three we have a case of using conditional introduction, using the subproof that begins at line one and ends at line two, and this allows us to reason to if RA, then RAA. And at line four, we make use of universal introduction, taking the entire formula at line three and replacing every instance of A with the universally quantified X. 
You'll know even though A is found in a subproof, this subproof is no longer active. That is, when we make use of conditional introduction at line three, this subproof is effectively closed. In addition, one of the things that you'll note is that A is not found in the resulting formula. And so neither of the restrictions are violated. Furthermore, if you notice, this A could have been any formula. We could have assumed two Bs up here, or Cs, or Ds, any pair of names. We, would have, we could have derived our BB, then our BB, or our CC, then our CC. Next, let's look at some violations of universal introduction. That is cases where we use it incorrectly. First, if we had a formula like LAA, and use universal introduction to on it, we would be violating the first restriction, which says that you cannot use universal introduction if the name that you are transforming into a universally quantified variable, that is the name you're generalizing from, is found in a premise. Another example of a violation of this first restriction is this example here where we have LAA, and this formula is found as an assumption in an active subproof. Here, essentially, we're saying Alfred loves Alfred, or Alfred loves himself, and then we're reason reasoning from this instance to the formula that everyone loves themselves. Since A is found as an assumption, or in an assumption in an active subproof, we can't make use of universal introduction upon it. Finally, here's an example where the second restriction is violated. At line one, we have AX, PXX. Then we make use of universal elimination on line one, replacing each instance of X with A. And then at line three, we, we violate the second restriction because A is found in the resulting universally quantified formula. So returning to the formulation of the rule for universal introduction, the rule states that we can reason to a universally quantified formula from a formula that contains a name provided the name that's found in the formula does not occur as a premise or as an assumption in an open subproof, and the name A does not occur in the resulting universally quantified formula. What we also saw was these restrictions are put in place to ensure that the name A that we're universalizing could be any name, and if it could be any name, then it could refer to any item in the domain of discourse.